he would call it the Royal Road. This was quite the engineering feat, because this had to traverse through mountains, forests, deserts. So typically, earth would be packed, hardened, for example. They may not have had, had uh, asphalt, but they certainly had knowledge of uh, packing gravel or tiny rocks. Laying down a stone road is vital in a terrain where there could be a high water table. You don't want to get your feet stuck in the mud. You don't want to get your cart stuck in the mud. So you have to raise the road surface up. That means laying down some kind of surface initially that will either absorb the groundwater or not allow the groundwater to uh, displace the road. The Royal Road was linked by 111 rest stations and inns every 18 miles, where travelers could eat, sleep, and switch to fresh horses. To ensure safety, watchmen were posted all along its great length. Now, I'm going to talk with my friend, Dr. Lloyd Llewellyn Jones from the University of Edinburgh, professor of ancient history. I got to ask you this. Was it that safe? Essentially, yeah. I think what uh, uh, Darius, or Darius, if you will, manages to do here is uh, an incredible feat. I mean, we're standing here in Turkey, OK? Right. And we could take one route straight the way through into central Iran. I mean, that's pretty good going. How think? fast? OK, so if we're on horseback and uh, we're riding from one of these little garrisons to garrison every 15 miles, changing fresh horses, we can do that in about six, seven days, maybe. Six, six or days. seven days. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you could send messages on this road, mm -hmm. friends, yeah, next, most next city? most definitely. And, you know, and for trade, it, it's a godsend, as you can imagine. And this, this road cut through so much stuff. I mean, it just doesn't follow, you know, a, a formal pathway. It has to cross rivers, so it crosses the Tigris, it crosses by the ferry, Red Palace, by, by ferry, right. Uh, sometimes it clings to the side of mountains, sometimes it clings to the side of rivers. So the terrain is changeable. It's not drained or anything like that, so it's, it's not as advanced as some of the Roman roads we get right. later periods. So it doesn't have a gutter system? No, nothing like that, nothing like that. that. But what it's essentially is, it's sort of maybe 20 feet wide uh, with a sort of chip-in base, which is good for horse treads and sure. that kind of stuff, you know? And which carriages really, and Exactly, and to carriers. get things through as quickly as you can, basically. Well, Lloyd, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, thank you for enlightening us about this incredible road. But Darius still wasn't through. There was one territory Darius had yet to firmly control the vast riches of North Africa, and he was determined to build a gateway there. He had his engineers devise a giant canal linking the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Everyone has heard of the Suez Canal, but how many have heard of Darius's canal? What Darius did was build an east-west canal that was 130 miles long. With the Persian knowledge of hydrology, Darius's engineers used digging tools made of bronze and iron to first open the canal, then clear any blown sand and line it with stone ready for his ships to sail. It would take seven years to complete the 130-mile-long waterway with a massive labor force of Egyptian stone cutters and canal builders. Parts of the canal between the Nile and the Red Sea were, were actually not waterways, but just points along which the, the ships could be dragged uh, until they reached uh, another deeper portion where they could again sail their course. Darius says, I, Darius, king of kings, conqueror of Egypt, built this canal. He connected the Red Sea to the Nile River for trade, and he says, and ships were brought along my canal. By 500 BC, Persia was the largest empire the world had ever seen, even exceeding the size and wealth of Rome at its height four centuries later. Persia was invincible, and its appetite for conquest was beginning to frighten an emerging power across the Mediterranean, the city-states of Greece. Just a little geographical info. That big body of water out there is the Black Sea. This thin body of water here is the Bosphorus Strait that connects the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. So I'm standing in Asia, or Asia Minor, if you will, and that land over there is Europe. Now, in 494 BC, Darius put down a revolt from some cities on the coast of Turkey. But this revolt had been supported by Athens, so Darius wanted to teach Athens a lesson. He was going to march on Greece and attack that city. But how is he going to do it? 
He's got to go across the sea. Well, he takes a bridge of boats, pontoons, if you will, and lines them up from that point to that point and marches an army, so Herodotus says, of 70,000 men across the sea to attack Greece. Amazing. Persian engineers connected one side of the Bosporus to the other by scuttling boats side by side to form the foundation. Then they built a highway across the top, linking Asia to Europe. Probably this was a system of planks, and underneath there was a system of packed earth, or perhaps dry wood, to keep basically the road stable. Now, to keep the ships from wobbling, they must have used an anchor system of a certain weight, because if the anchor would have been too heavy, that would have, of course, tilted or damaged the ships. There was no breaking of the planks, not only due to the weight of the army crossing it, but due to the choppy waters of the Bosphorus. That's quite the feat of engineering before the age of computers. It is late August in the year 490 BC. Darius has already marched into Greece and taken Macedonia. Now he's destined to meet the Greek general Themistocles and an army from Athens and Corinth at the famous Battle of Marathon. A massive army from Persia numbers 60,000 or 140,000, 250,000, depending upon the propaganda you read. Suffice it to say, the Greeks are outnumbered 10 to 1. Their only recourse is to send for reinforcements. So the legendary runner Philippides runs from Marathon to Sparta, a distance of 140 miles in two days, hence the name of the race, Marathon. The two armies faced each other separated by a vast open plain. If they clashed head on, the massive Persian forces would mow down the greatly outnumbered Greeks. This was the beginning of the Persian Wars. A reduced Greek force attacked the Persians head on. The Persians went for an easy kill. But the remaining Greek forces had split into two and opened two other fronts against the Persians. Sucked into a bloody slaughter pit, the Persians suffered heavy losses and retreated. For the Greeks, it was a great victory. For the Persians, just a speed bump on their path to world domination. Darius decided to return home and turn his attention to shoring up Persepolis, his capital city. He would never get there. In 486 BC, Darius died on his way to quelling a rebellion in Egypt, leaving behind an empire that redefined the very notions of power and glory. He also prevented a replay of the chaos that followed the death of Cyrus by naming his successor, his son Xerxes. Now Cyrus the innovator and Darius the expansionist were very hard acts to follow. But Xerxes had been a king in waiting all of his life. And a couple of his first acts were to suppress a rebellion in Babylon, another one in Egypt. And then he went after the Greeks. Somehow the Greeks just stuck in his craw. Some historians argue that Xerxes was making a preemptive strike. Others say that he was just cleaning up the business of his father. Whatever the case, the Greeks were no longer intimidated or impressed by the Persians since they'd beaten them at Marathon. And so Xerxes buddied up with the Carthaginian navy and the tip of what is now modern Tunisia, and he decided to beat the Greeks at sea. Discovered in 1931, Persepolis is one of the last archaeological excavations that dates back to the ancient world. Four eighty B.C. The Persian Empire is at its peak, vast, immensely powerful, and incredibly rich. It's been ten years since the Greeks defeated Darius the Great at the Battle of Marathon. His son Xerxes is now the latest absolute monarch in Persia's Achaemenid dynasty, and Xerxes wants revenge. Greece is only beginning to emerge as a force to be reckoned with, a coalition of profoundly different city-states, from democracies to dictatorships. They are united only by one creed, their hatred of Persia. The ancient world is on the verge of the second Persian War. 